In just a few minutes, you'll have an opportunity to hear from Dr. Avedis Panagian, core faculty in our clinical department. He'll be discussing psychoanalytical treatment of the psychotic patient. Feel free to share comments and ask questions throughout the discussion. We'll give Dr. Panagian a chance at the end to answer as many questions as we can. Before I introduce him, I'd like you to meet Dr. Rika Tribio, Senior Director of Enrollment Management. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us from all over the world. Welcome to our webinar this morning, and uh, we are very pleased to have Dr. Avedis Panagian join us today. Um, and uh, we are very pleased that you've made time for us today as well. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Rika Tribio. I'm the Senior Director of Enrollment Management, and I'm part of the team that will be assisting you throughout the admissions process. So just to let you all know that for joining this webinar this morning, your application fee will be waived through Monday. So if you go to our main Pacifica website page, pacifica.edu, on the very first page, there is an orange button somewhere there in the corner. And if you just click that to apply, it takes about five minutes to fill out the application. Don't feel obliged to have all of your application documents collected already because an admissions advisor will be contacting you and walking you through the process as we procure those documents. So again, just take those five minutes and fill out that application form. It is free for you until Monday for registering here with us. So again, I thank you for joining us and I turn it over to Mona Valdez and Dr. Panagian. Thank you, Dr. Tribio. And now here's Dr. Panagian. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Rika. Thank you, Gavin, helping us. And I want to dedicate today's talk to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jennifer Sandeville and Dr. Elizabeth Shuey for doing outstanding work. I want to also thank all the listeners, prospective students, faculty, current students for joining us and really appreciate you attending. Now the topic usually takes four or five hours to do a comprehensive work for on the topic of psychosis. So we have 45 minutes and then questions. Now, let me say that psychosis, the last 30 years, unfortunately, there has, it's not being trained. Therapists, psychiatrists are not being trained to treat psychotic patients. That is uh, what's been going on the last 30 years, 25 years. As a result, they are deemed not treatable, which is, of course, erroneous. Uh, the problem is that <coughs> training has stopped throughout the world, not just in the United States. And as a result, medication has taken over what we used to get trained and treat in private practice, uh, psychotic patients in treatment. That has become almost history. Sometimes we have one or two uh, in practice that continue with us and they remind us how they are treatable. There is no evidence whatsoever that psychosis, including schizophrenia, is heredity. There is no such conclusive evidence. If anything, it's more and more showing the role of the environment. Now, if I say the role environment, obviously I don't mean that simplistically. In other words, individuals who think that somehow uh, dealing with their traumas and uh, talking about their traumas and so on, that will help the patient to transform. That's very naive and very inexperienced and too good to be true. Psychotic construction is extremely rigid and tenacious mind that has substituted the mind that non-psychotic have that really has to do with 
understanding, being curious and learning about our psychic reality and reality that we deal from day to day with the outside world. Now, uh, trauma has contributed. It is psychosis, environmental trauma, as Winnicott said. However, that construction that I'm going to talk today and the dynamic, as you will see with some, some ways that I will talk about them and a couple of people I take as an example, the rigidity and tenacity of these patients. So it is a separate construction, just like we have ways we have constructed our psyche that's not psychotic, their mind is antagonistic to the mind that other people have who are not psychotic, antagonistic. It starts sometimes prenatally, but clearly postnatally, and uh, we have enough evidence that with many of them, it starts even prenatally. Uh, environment where the growing infant has not felt a sense of safety and security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Winnicott concepts of holding where safety and security is essential and literal environmental holding, including touch. There's a chronic, chronic sense of security that the fetus the, and the infant has experienced. In addition, the notion of containment, containment in terms of interaction between the, the caretaker and the baby has not been one that the baby has internalized, has internalized an emotional experience and the thinking mind of the caretaker, whereby that, so to speak, couple, the musicality of that relationship, one has been deprived of that. So right from infancy, what happens is the infant withdraws. Incidentally, psychosis, as you know, homeless individuals, many of them actually are not schizophrenics. However, one might say they are psychotic, out of loneliness. So the baby the in, in infancy withdraws, withdraws because the environment becomes unbearable. Psychically, one would die if not physically. So they have to disconnect from the environment and they have to withdraw psychically. This withdrawal and as a result, the loneliness that starts in infancy is what many homeless people have experienced. So when you see homeless people talking to themselves, that is really out of loneliness and they are really developing characters and so that there'll be companion for them. Companion, they're not left in unbearable loneliness. So this aloneness and loneliness starts in infancy. So you got two worlds right from infancy, the external world and the world of uh, disconnection from the env environment, the external world, withdrawing into one's body. Freud talked about autoerotism. In other words, in narcissism, how one withdraws to one's body. This is a still very valid when we talk about psychosis. In infancy, one withdraws to their body and that begins a way of stimulating feeling sensations. So psychosis starts really in the realm of sensoriality. Withdrawing into the body as the baby develops, evolving fantasies that's coming straight from their stimulation of the body. This replaces the world of the external and works in parallel with that. Now, this is why we see some children who really can stare at television 24 seven really, 
and children who have no interest in playing with other kids. And indeed, they could become rather pretty violent if they are with other kids. Later on, you see learning disability. Those are not because HD, ADHD. Those are because they cannot be without being so dominated by and be flooded by their sensoriality that has to do or everything evolving is from their body. Sensation, perceptions, the way they're perceiving others is speed of light, very hyperbolic. So as a result, that becomes very difficult for them to concentrate, to focus, and it, it comes out as learning disability. They ignore their environment. This creates a very secret life, secret life, private secret life in their own head starts right in infancy. Eventually, dissociation occurs whereby one has developed even characters in their own psyche. And that state of mind can coexist appearing as if they're compliant with the external universe. However, secretly, they are keeping their compulsion that's coming out of their body, at times chronic masturbation, at times very chaotic existence, whereby they don't make sense what goes on in their psyche nor in their environment. Sensorially based fantasies, separate them from the world of object relations. Person loses cues, social cues, how to manage with people. They misunderstand various cues. The anxiety escalates. One thing this withdrawal helps them is protects them from anxiety. It gives them alternate world. It does, however, something also very unfortunate. It snaps their affective development, snaps the energy that's required to deal with people. They become tired and exhausted very quickly if they have to deal with external universe. Infantile withdrawal is progressive pathological process. One loses pleasure in the social play, and one begins to have enormous pleasure from their sensation and perception that really comes from their bodily stimulation. This leads paradoxically extreme euphoria, eventually grandiosity, omnipotence, all kinds of uh, pleasurable fantasies or very chronic persecutory very harmful sadomasochistic fantasies. Uh, what happens also, the exact thing that overstimulates them, their sensation and perception, also leads simultaneously to extreme passivity. They can become blank and stupor and numb, almost drug state of mind. Blankness, blankness, operate simultaneously with hyper vigilance, hyperactivity, hyperbolic reactivity. Now sensorially dominated individual that leads to psychotic construction is an individual who loses curiosity about learning. Learning from emotional experience one begins to lose. So one has to distinguish, one has to distinguish between sensory dominated individual from emotionally dominated. Sensoriality is not emotional experience. As you can see, culture in a way encourages virtual reality, the kind of reality as if as if technology is the same as dealing with interpersonal relations. That is being more and more 
contributing, I think, to psychotic construction. Accompanied with that, the breakdown of family system, the breakdown and poverty and discrimination and so on. All of these are contributing more and more why we see sensorially dominated individuals. So let me go back to psychotic construction. Sexualized mind, grandiose, omnipotent mind, uh, accompanied with at times very petrifying, persecutory, uh, secret life. When they are external world, they are very vigilant. They become very jumpy, very jumpy, because they cannot track what's going on in the world. This is a construction that has robbed the person of a healthy mind. A construction that robs the person of a healthy mind. This construction lives inside them and it's antagonistic in a way colonizes any healthy form of listening to anything else. Now, what I'm getting to here, this kind of a mind develops slowly, right prenatally and postnatally when by the time we hear hallucination and delusions, it's way later when the mind, psychotic mind has been constructed. Psychotic mind leaves a person pretty much fatigue, filled with anxiety and fatigue because one has to face one way or another external reality because they're so not used to that, because of the antagonism, antagonism of the psychotic mind, psychotic structure, it leaves them very fatigued very quickly. Their relationship with the external mind becomes very impulsive at times and very violent. When I say violent, I don't mean necessarily physically violent. Actually, that is very rare. That's a misnotion, including homeless people. That's extremely rare. It is an emotion. It is a violence that comes from explosive sensory outburst. It's not even an emotional violence. In other words, it's not a notion of I hate you. I can't stay in you. Stop. Shut up. You know, it's a very violent reactivity. You have to make a distinction between stimulus response versus an emotion of hate, love, tolerance, compassion, feeling, sadness. Psychotic construction cannot tolerate any form of linking, two things coming together. In other words, in order to create concepts, ideas, you need two things to come together. Psychotic mind cannot tolerate that. As a result, symbolization is not formed. Symbolization is not formed. This is important because psychotherapists, including psychoanalysts, salivate with content analysis, analyzing content and thinking symbolically. That will make the patient more confused and more disorganized. You, you, the job of the therapist is to learn how to, how to help develop, to construct, diminish the power of the psychotic construction and enhance the non-psychotic construction. In other words, our work is at each moment, how is psychotic construction becoming antagonistic to become simply aware, simply conscious, simply listening, simply being attentive? Psychotic construction is anti-auditory, anti-visual, anti-touch, anti-feeling, anti-being aware. 
it's antagonistic to all those things. In other words, they create their own perception out of their bodily sensation. It's not you and I are looking at me and I can see Mona and I can see Rika's uh, name there. It's not like that. They, their sensation produces different perception and different auditory sounds as I will take a couple of examples in a few minutes. You and I can look at each other and see each other. That's the non-psychotic person. We listen, we use our ears to take the person in, although that's not an easy quality in human beings either, even including neurotic people. Now, psychotic person is antagonistic sense organs, being aware. So you have to start from that. The war is going to start between, in the session, being aware and what's being created by their sensations and by our sense organs of vision, audition, listening, and indeed their psychotic construction is becoming antagonistic to their healthy side because every psychotic person has a healthy side. Freud said that. Jung said that, Bian said that, Winnicott said that. Every psychotic person somewhere has a healthy side. So we need to increase, we need to tap the healthy side. Psychotic side promises them things that they won't deliver. It promises them special power, special pleasure, special excitement. Psychotic side promises them, if you jump from the airplane, this is a real patient. If you jump from an airplane, you can fly like a parachute. One could literally jump from an airplane. One could literally jump or tries to, if they are indeed having such a delusion. Promises. Or sameness, no novelty, no learning, the same and the same and the same. And drugging effect, they become like a state of drugging, drugged, almost like hypnotized, passivity. So it is important we help them understand the seduction of the psychotic construction. It seduces them with propaganda verbally or non-verbally. Here is a good example. When a patient was listening to me, this is only recently, when a patient was listening to me, he said, I'm, I'm afraid of electric shock. I don't want to have electric shock. I don't have, I want to have electric shock. Now, first I thought electric shock, literally electric shock, which could very well be that, but there is very important thing to also keep in mind. This is why you have to be more concrete in listening than you can imagine how concrete they are. I understood that based on how much confusion was going inside him, each time he was listening to me, and indeed he will tell me what he heard me saying, an electric sound was going in his head, an incredible loud noise that was distracting him and leading him into confusion. Almost reminded him, it became same as electric shock that he has got historically. So electric shock was literally in the session as the patient was taking in from me little bit. And he would tell me, could you say that again? Because I got very confused and lost. Of course, I was helping him to see that structure without using such language, that force is interrupting his listening to me. That force is telling him it's not valuable 
for him to listen. He will go secretly and withdraw. It will promise him much better things that he will get from me. So this is what you need to do. What you need to do in the here and now, forget about their traumas, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. It's worth for you to know about it. For keep in mind in the here and now, describe not to analyze the dynamic of their hallucination or delusions. That will lead them for disorganization. However, uh, describe, describe to them how their psychotic structure is really operating in the relationship with me and with them, the healthy side, and the psychotic force right now, describe them how the two are operating and how that force structure is coming up between them and me. So it is important you really do that. And it is important when they become vigilant and yell, yell for example, stop, stop, you better stop. Ambitious therapists, it won't work. Too ambitious, too optimistic therapists will not work. Too anxious therapists, you have to be careful. Especially if you're panic, then you have to get proper help to work with them. It doesn't work. Panic, too much ambition. What will work, have some anxiety. As much as possible, you need to be present with them as a human being interested to simply be with them. Simply be with them, you are going to be as elementary as you can imagine. Describe one thing relating to another thing. The phenomena of various relationships with each other right now. And when they lose patience with you, you just slow down as much as you can. If they pace, slow down. If they walk around, if they keep the door half open, allow them to do that. One patient who will always have rats in his ears as I'm talking to him, always rats. Now you can think about rat creating feces and shit. That will be dynamic way thinking about it. Do not go there. Rats, and high sounds of being as if rats are chewing in his ears. In order, in order the delusions and the hallucination obstruct him to listen to me. Delusions are nothing but obstruction against communication so that the patient is withdrawn to their retreat they don't have to deal with the torture that they have to put up in learning something new. So do not go into dynamics. Now their dreams, I can see time is running up. So with their dreams, their dreams usually would tell us something, a kind of a premonition anticipating their breakdown. It's a very good signal what they dream. They're almost always very confusing and surreal. Reality and unreality are mixed together. Almost like you're watching a science fiction. A human being is, some of you know, drawing of person of psychotics, where it's fluid, fluid figures mixed with other figures. They're basically telling us the impending possibility of delusion and hallucination, which makes me think about their breakdown. Now, we can't avoid at times breakdown. However, do not look at it and panic as an ominous thing. Where every breakdown, there is an opportunity for new insight, new learning. Indeed, during their breakdown, temporary medication could help. However, I have a patient who takes such a minor dose 
because he doesn't want to be drugged. He knows what it is to be over medicated. He does not want that. So it's very important you be careful whether somebody is drug based on medication. You want their reactivity to be there. Their first breakdown is essential. Almost always following breakdowns is because the first breakdown, the patient was not treated adequately, including those of us who treat such people. We have been either too optimistic or maybe because family members didn't support the patient, they didn't have the money or for whatever reason they stopped treatment. The, the future breakdown gives us messages what was not dealt with the first breakdown. First breakdown as much as possible, these patients need to get more and more thorough help, comprehensive help, which is nowadays, unfortunately, is a rarity. Countertransference, as I was saying earlier, panic is unhealthy. Too much optimism, you're deceiving yourself. Idealistic wishes is a make-believe reality. If they're too attached to you, they're not, they are mimicking that's almost false, false cure. It's important you don't patronize them and not talk to them like children. Your curiosity should not be very intrusive. You have to be respectful to them. And as I said, you need to be as concrete as possible hateful feelings and wishing to absolutely smack their brain is very normal. Do not express such feelings when you are, when you are at the height of such emotion. Your job is to contain them and access some compassion for the patient. The pleasures they get from delusion and hallucination, you should not underestimate. There's an incredible pleasure they get from that. Imagination or images, you have to be careful. Imagination or images for a psychotic patient is sensory based. You will see that they're not creative imagination. They're the same broken record. They move from one psychotic construction to another. So imagination and images in a neurotic, there's new learning. There is new reverie that one has. That's not the same in psychotic construction. So what it's a false, it's a false, imagination, is make-believe imagination, is based on their sensory overload. They can have images or as if they are imagining. It's not from a mind, a construction of a mind. It's not coming from that. It's not coming from psychic reality and external reality. Let me address that, psychic reality that psychotic person absolutely has lost it from early development is how do we register our conscious feeling and unconscious feelings and experiences, our unconscious fantasies, all those, how is it, re how is it registered in us? We're unconscious of that. Believe that what drives us, it's not in our conscious control. Do we have a curiosity to learn more about our psychic reality and uh, an external reality? Psychotic construction, they have no clue about their psychic reality. So as a result, their imagination does not from, from really accessing pre-conscious material from themselves, from their unconscious. It doesn't come from there. It is comes from overly sensory uh, stimulation, fabricating as if it's a mind. 
the mind needs to develop between the patient and the, and the therapist. Now, uh, one more thing here. During weekends, during breaks, psychotic patient usually gets worse and is valuable to help them be prepared for, what, for weekend breaks or between sessions because the psychotic construction is like a snake. It is an opportunist. It's very important you let them know that when you are not there, it's going to come in. In a way, take, colonize the patient's healthy side. It's going to sap their energy, hypnotize them, pacify them, put them in a stupor, create all kinds of propaganda against the therapist and against the world, and tell them that they have much more pleasure with their power, with their body, with their pornography, with their compulsion, and so on. So very valuable to prepare them what to anticipate when they're not with you. They will appreciate that a lot. They'll be a little bit prepared for that. It sh you should not think psychotic construction as a defense. Defense helps us develop stable mind to deal with ourselves and others. It's not a defense. It is a construction. And one more thing here. Those of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, Dr. Panagian, don't we all have a psychotic side to us? I think you're missing the boat in asking such a question. We all can regress. We all can lose control. We all can be impulsive. We all can be disoriented. We all can talk to ourselves. We all can believe in magic or whatever. If you are constructed, having a mind, you have a mind, you have a mind. If you are constructed, a mind got deficient and so fragile in dealing with your psychic reality and external reality, then you really don't have a mind of your own. You don't have a mind of your own. You are in a prisoner, in a prison. Psychotic mind is in a fortress that develops slowly until it becomes a prison. A fortress becomes a prison, a retreat whereby the patient loses their ability to be free. Neurotic mind captures freedom, including personality organizations have considerable freedom, considerable freedom. So you have to be careful, those of you who use a bit more cliche that everybody has a psychotic side. That's a bit confusing. You are talking more most likely about neurotic patient when they regress or certain personality disorders who on and off, they might lose their freedom or they have somewhat vulnerable structure, but nevertheless, they can function quite well in their own way. Now I'll open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Panagian. So um, if you um, click on the Q&A there, doctor, you'll be able to see we do have a few questions there. Q&A, where would that be? Okay. So the, okay. Uh, all I have is on the right side. Oh, Q&A. Yeah, I got it at the bottom. Okay. What and how would one link, study, explain this epigenic and the therapy or research in terms of psychotic client? What and how would one link, study, explain the study 
epigenetics and the therapy or research in terms of psychotic client. Uh, I need to understand the question more. So I don't know what study, what research or what, how to link it. All I can tell you is that, all I can tell you that neuroscientific research are not showing that there is a conclusive heredity component to psychotic mind, including schizophrenic at times, there is some disposition, as one of our students at Pacifica did his dissertation on schizophrenia, and I was the chair. We had a legend on schizophrenia from Austin Riggs on the committee. He had no problem in uh, what we were talking about, and he was an MD, a psychoanalyst, psychiatrist from Austin Riggs. He agreed with us that there are there is no conclusive uh, study. I do think that more and more focusing on this complex uh, generational trauma, prenatal traumas, early infantile traumas. But once the construction takes over, you have to focus on and study the relationship of this construction to rigidity tenacity in terms of using more and more descriptive phenomenological approach while you are a psychoanalyst. Question number two, many times there are comorbidities present when dealing with a psychotic client, for example, substance use disorder. How does that affect treatment? Well, it does a lot. It does a lot. The question is how does drug abuse effect. That is one of the biggest problem. If a person I see, uh, I'm not seeing anybody in any institution, only psychotics I see is in private practice. I would not see a psychotic patient who is more than marijuana use. I will not see them if they are abusing other drugs. They need to detox before I will treat them because that will uh, be very difficult to ascertain what's coming from substance use and what's coming from their psychosis. That is one of the most complicated situation. As some of you know, you don't need to be a psychotic patient to become psychotic if you are using psychiatric drugs, including my marijuana, you can be, have psychotic moments including hallucinate and be delusional. No mixing of psychiatric drug with marijuana or other drugs. Question number T, is it possible to replay the recording to that point or ask Dr. Panagian to repeat that portion? I don't know which portion he means. I'm not sure either. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me see here. I don't want to forget. Okay. What about the use of art drawing with the psychotic? Uh, you can do that. I do think that there is, in my opinion, <clears throat> there is a great method in institution or even in the office. I don't, I do some drawings. I do different figures, geometrical figures, give them. And uh, some of them uh, lose them, some of them hold on to them. I, may, I, I tell you why that is important. And I like that question a lot. And I want to thank Jennifer Smee, I think, okay, for that question. I, first of all, it is something other than them they're creating. Second, they can talk to you about it. So there is some attempt to relate to it. And I, not only that, they're taking something I gave them on a piece of paper. However, don't be surprised if they can lose them. And do not take it personal. Do not address why they lost it. Do not deal with dynamic material. 
our therapists are good not get into that. Not very good not getting into that. I'm a strong believer in that and very wise way to do that. Can you speak more about how the mind develops between the patient and therapist during the treatment? Good question. That is the hardest thing. Uh, that's the most difficult thing to do. And sometimes patient can tolerate you 20 minutes, which is perfectly fine. 15 minutes, half an hour. Don't force them to stay 50 minutes. What is the usual mode is if a patient goes totally silent on you, almost always they're being flooded by psychotic construction. You need to study the psychotic construction indirectly, indirectly. Uh, eye movement, gestures, total silence, suddenly few words that you can't decipher at all what the hell one said. Now, don't be curious about it too much. You might, you might say something, I couldn't hear that. Although one psychotic patient told me I need to see a doctor <laughs> to check my hearing, you know, because I wasn't understanding their murmur. The person was not talking to me. Was hallucinating because I have no problem. My hearing is pretty well. So you have to be careful with that. So indirectly, you have to a little bit try to figure out the potency of the psychotic construction. It oscillates. At times, it becomes extremely tenacious when they are with us. Other times, you might materialize few minutes, few seconds to say something to them. And back off, take your time, speak slowly, speak slowly. Why I say that? So that you're opening up a little bit room for the psychotic construction to show itself. You want the, the psychotic, I usually tell my, some of my psychotic patients who are more cooperative after long term of work. I say, those of them who have seen exorcists, I say, I want to see Linda Blair here. I want to welcome Linda Blair here. You see, because they're opportunist. On some level, they're relieved that they, you can see. But on the other hand, they have to pay for it because the antagonism increases. So that's as much as I can say at this moment. Be careful about your countertransference. You have to be careful and trust your ability you can hold yourself together. You have to be body, mind connection inside you. If you're sitting at the edge of your seat, that's not a good sign. Sit down and be in your body and relax in the presence of psychotic construction. If you have very hard time, you need to be in treatment. You need to be in treatment or not work with them. It doesn't work. Okay, I uh, don't know enough about expert on marijuana, but I can tell you it makes psychosis worse. Can you explain further what you mean by their images and imagine it does not come from themselves, but from sense? What is the source of, okay, uh, that's a good question. A mind, can uh, Barry Williams, a, a mind that's neurotic. You have your mind of your own. Your images are in your imaginations. You can say you had images and imagination. Psychotic construction has no clue about what is 
an image, an imagination, what is not, not having one. You can distinguish the two. That's the freedom you and I have to ask such a question. That's such question you ask. You're not psychotic, Barry. And I'll bill you for that later. You know, I can see you, Mona is smiling. So the point is that you don't have that differentiation. One thing we need to do with a psychotic patient, the worst thing for them is to listen to you. And the hardest thing for them to tolerate your ability to listen to them. Listening is taking a human being in. That's why human being can stand listening to others because you are taking the whole person in. Most people are thinking and talking while they're listening. I don't think and talk when I'm listening, okay? I don't think and talk when I'm listening. I simply listen. So they, don't, they like and they don't like. Healthy side of them like, antagonistic side, they don't like you take them in. So you have the freedom, Barry, to imagine, to have imagination and stop having imagination. You having a dream, you not having a dream. They cannot make those distinctions. Therefore, their images and imagination coming from sensoriality, their body generating all kinds of euphoric images, omnipotent images, and imagination, let me kill you, imagine, images and imagination. Here is one, somebody floating from the clouds on a bed, on a bed, floating on a cloud, from the clouds on a bed. As the bed approached, approached the ground, they woke up. They had an image like that. Well, you know what? They woke up, I mean, they suddenly, their body got shaken. They got started coming to look at me. That was not an imagination. They don't know the difference. Was that sensorially, in other words, that image came being flooded by euphoria over excitement. And suddenly one woke up from that image so that they're with me. And then they went total silent in the session. You might not do it, react like that at all. You would say, oh, I just drifted for a second. You distinguish the two. You have freedom. The person who has images and imagination as if they have freedom, they don't have the freedom. It's coming from pleasure or pain, persecution or pleasure. Okay, let me read some more. Wow, this has been unbelievably informative. Thank you so much. My question, the psychotic sensory imagination, is this completely about pleasure, stopping loneliness? You know, keeping company, keeping euphoria, persecution. I think that anxiety is a big one. And the more they get older, the more they are not getting help. Unfortunately, the healthy side become very, very colonized. You know, those are harder to reach. So uh, I would say those are the biggest ones that I have spoken about really why they retreat. How can you support the family when part of the first psychotic break include, included violence so that family can continue to support the patient? Well, almost always it's not violence physically, although I don't want to rule that out in the sense of hitting a sibling, uh, but I have to tell you something they will be taunted for them to hit somebody. We have misdiagnosed 
uh, misdiagnosed attention deficit adolescents. And the, and the parents, usually uh, the father is a bully and they will punch their dad, you know? And you know what? That is because somebody is not appreciating the psychotic construction of that adolescence is not appreciating. You cannot bully a psychotic construction. You could get a physical violence. If not, most often extreme violent outburst. Can you elucidate with disorders, eating, eating disorders with its rigid, rigid sensory? Uh, it's not a psychotic construction. It's much more personality uh, disorganization. Not all eating disorder, by the way, have a personality disorder. And some of them could be neurotic also, such as histrionic or depressive neurosis. I would say that uh, psychotic construction can occur with eating disorder but it's not usually the case. It's much more with borderline narcissistic disorders and hysterical disorders, usually that. But occasionally it can happen. But, you know, such a suicide also, right? Listening to a delusion, but not, not predominantly. Generally speaking, how do you find their healthy side? Well, if they're coming to see me, they have a healthy side. If they're coming to see me, they have a healthy side. If they're hospitalized first time, they have a strong healthy side. Uh, family, family members who care about them see that they have a healthy side. Sometimes they ask help themselves. I think it's important not to demonize and see these people hopeless. And I hope I'm reactivating few things here uh, in people to not look at them as hopeless the way psychiatry and psychology has done the last 30 years. They have given up hope. Those of us who love getting trained and working with them, unfortunately, less and less come to treatment nowadays based on the fact that the culture has given up on them. And I also think that uh, families have given up on them. Economy has given up on them. You know, the quicker, the, the quicker and the shorter the treatment, the better. That's what the fallacy, the mythology is. Rather than, incidentally, I just had a thought interrupting me which is more important to tell you. Forget about getting rid of the psychotic construction. Your job is to create differentiation between the two, integration between the two, so that they have a healthy regression, so that they can signal things. The problem with therapists and psychiatry and psychology is the problem of cure. That, it's like, if you have a heart surgery, that's not a brand new car. If you have a psychotic construction, you can't have suddenly brand new car. That's crazy thinking. So, I'm not interested in to cure, eliminating. That's it, dismissing it, it's over. I'm interested in differentiating the power of one over the other, describing how they do, integrate the two so that they have more a mind of their own, not lobotomy, not lobotomy. Cure is almost lobotomy. It's like, can you cure me being in my 70s? Give me uh, 50 years, please. Could you do that? All the exercise in the world doesn't do that. And I want to thank all of you for showing up today. Thank you so much, Dr. Panagian. And yes, we're so grateful that you joined us today.